Hey everyone. So at the uh, end of last class, we finished off talking about uh, how energy, we get our energy through the food that we eat. And you can group organisms into one of two kinds, either autotrophs or heterotrophs. And when you look at any ecosystem, um, in general, you'll see uh, quite commonly described uh, as what we call energy pyramids. And in any ecosystem, the energy can be passed from one organism through another, through what we call a food chain or a food web. And at the bottom of any food chain, we see the producers. All right, so in this case, this looks like a, an aquatic food web. And so we have the producers at the bottom of uh, the food web. We've got algae and uh, a lily pad here. So we've got plants, right? And these plants provide the energy for the primary consumers. So you can think of primary consumers as like your herbivores that feed only on plants. And then uh, those primary consumers provide energy for your secondary consumers. And those provide energy for your higher order or what we call tertiary consumers. But what's really important in any food web is that what we'll typically see um, as we look at it is this sort of pyramid shape based on numbers. And what that means is your greatest population of organisms occurs at the base and there's fewer and fewer organisms as you go up the food chain. And the reason for that is, is that energy at each level is lost. So let's kind of consider that in the next diagram here. So energy flows through ecosystems, whereas matter cycles. And what that means, simply put, is we put energy into an ecosystem. And if we follow that um, energy through a various food web or food chain or follow it through an ecosystem, we can see that here the plants are taking in that energy, the producers, and they're producing their energy in the form of glucose. And so they're going to make bonds of glucose and they're going to pass that on to their primary consumers. And so if we follow this red line, this red line down here, we can see represents energy stored in chemical bonds. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this energy from the sun has gone into energy in the form of glucose. Now, glucose is matter, right? We've talked about that before. Matter being anything that has mass and space and all chemical compounds are matter. And so the plant has virtually taken the sun's energy and used it to create a molecule that's high in energy. And now that plant's molecules are available to these primary consumers. So in other words, some of this energy from the sun has gone into these plants and they're going to pass it on to these consumers. But what you notice here is that some of that energy, and we talked about that yesterday, some of that energy is lost. We can see down here that energy is lost in the form of heat energy. So the available energy at the next level decreases, right? So due to loss of heat energy, there is less energy available less energy available
at the next level. And so hence why there will be fewer primary consumers in any ecosystem compared to the producers since there's less energy available. And the same process happens as we move from our primary consumers, right, onto our secondary or tertiary consumers, that there will be fewer and fewer of them. And that's where that picture up above came from in terms of what we call the energy pyramid. All right. And so we've got our producers down at the bottom. Right. And they're going to provide energy to our primary consumers who provide energy to our secondary consumers onto our tertiary and so on and so forth. But at each stage, a certain amount of energy is lost, right? Primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. And so energy is lost. as heat to the environment. So because some energy is lost, is lost at each level, at each trophic level, right? Some energy is lost at each trophic level. There must be fewer organisms. Fewer organisms as we go up the food chain. And if you think about that, if you look at a typical forest, right? I mean, you can look at the forest and we can see plants everywhere, right? And if we get into that forest, we, we would typically see far fewer deer. And if if the predator of choice in that forest ecosystem is a wolf or a cougar, well, we're going to see even far fewer wolves and cougars, far fewer tertiary consumers, these higher order consumers, what we think of predators. And so this is because energy is flowing through the ecosystem. And we did talk about how energy is conserved and it's never lost or destroyed, but remember it's just converted into unusable forms. And so this energy that we say lost as heat is just simply not available. So it hasn't disappeared, but energy in the form of thermal energy isn't very useful to the next uh, organism in the food chain. So whereas energy flows, matter cycles. So let's look at, um, those red arrows and blue arrows, which if we look down at the bottom represents the energy stored in chemical bonds and nutrients. So what we see if we follow these blue arrows, once the plants convert um, the sun's energy into sugars, well, we can see that the red arrows and the blue arrows are simply constantly cycling within the ecosystem. And they're not lost to the environment in the same way that thermal energy is lost in all of these different um, groups of organisms that represent the food chain. So matter is constantly cycling. And that's these elements and compounds that make up 
the molecules that make up us. Um, and that's kind of a cool thought to think of, um, you know, carbon atoms that existed in dinosaurs of hundreds of millions of years ago um, still remain uh, making up life around us. They make up you, they make up the plants and other animals around, right? So matter, right? The elements and compounds that make us up. are continuously cycled. in any ecosystem. Okay. So our goal is to look at these two very specific processes of photosynthesis. How do the plants make the sugar? And secondly, cellular respiration. How do organisms use that sugar to provide themselves with energy? And before we jump into that, let's just look at the two most important molecules of the whole process. And so we've talked about glucose as one of our important biological molecules. So this is our molecule of glucose. And so this molecule of glucose um, is what is produced by plants. during photosynthesis and over here we have our molecule of ATP and this is what is produced produced by plants and animals during cellular respiration. And so most students ask the question, right? So most students ask the question, well, why bother? Why, why not just use the energy in the glucose? So here's our ATP over here. And it's an interesting question. Um, glucose is really the... I mean, it's the universal molecule of energy in just about all life forms. Not all, but predominantly most living organisms on the planet use glucose for their energy, but they all use it to make this molecule ATP. So why bother to go through the conversion? Well. Um, glucose is very high in energy, very high energy molecule. Uh, in which case, if we were to rely on it for our processes in the cell, it would probably be very inefficient because there's so much energy there that a lot more energy would end up being lost um, because many cellular, uh, individual cellular processes require small amounts of energy um, at a time. And so with it being a very high energy molecule, if we were relying on it, a lot more energy might be wasted. Secondly, it, it's also a very stable molecule. And that's a good thing. So by using this Right? Remember back to our biological molecules, we store a lot of glucose within our cells as glycogen or starch, and that makes it available for when we need it. And then we convert it into ATP, which is uh, a much less stable 
it's a much less stable molecule. That makes it easier to get the energy out of, and it provides, you can think of it as providing smaller packets of energy at a time. Small packets of energy. And that energy comes from, sorry, I put over here ATP, but in fact, what's happening here in this reaction, here's our ATP molecule. And so what's happening when we get energy from here is this bond, this bond here is severed, releasing this phosphate, which we can see over on this side. And we're left with ADP and a phosphate and our energy for cell processes, right? For cell processes. All right. That's it for the first one. Next one to come.